Thank you. So now Thanks. I'd like to introduce our mid keynote speaker, Jason Johnson. Jason is the Friends of Lake Warner Executive Director. Take it away, Jason. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Watershed Summit. This is a really great gathering. I'm excited to, um, to, to talk more about everybody, uh, to everybody. Um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, pretty close to the Los Angeles River. Um, went to Humboldt State University where I designed a self-designed a self degree, multidisciplinary degree out of the uh, Natural Resources Department and Planning Interpretation Department um, called Watershed and Wetland Restoration. And it incorporated elements of hydrology, geology, forest management, fisheries biology, um, wastewater treatment, wetlands, so it was a, an appropriate technology engineering. So it was a it was a um, comprehensive at the time type of degree, and I was working for the River Institute, which was founded by Dr. Terry Roloff's um, fisheries professor, Murtis, really well known fisheries biologist and ecologist at Humboldt, um, as well as Bill Trush, who studied under Luna Leopold at Berkeley infamous famous uh, geomorphologist and hydrologist who's worked on all kinds of water rule of water resources and ecology related projects um, I moved to new england well i, I asked i worked with uh, william cure associates on the klamath resource information system which incorporated water quality and fisheries data from the klamath river watershed which is the second largest river in california um, that was a collaborative project with EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Water Resources Control Board, and others. Um, there are five sub-basins within the Klamath system, and then we also did a project uh, in the Sacramento, the Upper Sacramento system, as well as Northern Coastal California. Again, mostly geared at salmonids, um, at Pacific salmon species that were endangered at the time and the uh, Pacific Northwest forest um, issue, spotted owl issue was going on. So there were habitat conservation plans being developed and a lot of focus on sort of regional watershed management planning. So when I moved to uh, Massachusetts, I started working for Mass Wildlife, a little bit on the main stem of the Connecticut River uh, at the Fish Passage Facility, a bit on the Westfield River at that Fish Passage Facility, but mostly doing in-stream fish biology, working with juveniles in and out of streams from the state line to about the middle of the state and from the top to the bottom for several years. So um, working for Friends of Lake Warner was an interesting project. And um, <laughs> it sort of dropped into my lap out of, um, by being introduced to Terry, Terry Blunt. And um, Terry was an inf a famous water, resource protection person working for DCR, career DCR conservationist. Um, let's see, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen here. Um, and so when I got, when I got to Friends of Lake Warner in about 2008, you know, I really had no clue what what the what was going on with the lake um and so it was sort of brand new trying to put together a new project while at the same time getting to know all the players so um essentially we there was the negotiation of the fact that the dam needed to be repaired that was the major issue kestrel land trust was being was absorbing valley land fund who was the owner of the dam at the time and a bunch of concerned citizens um, had done work on the pond in 2003 to 2005. So we had sort of that basis to, um, to, work, to work with. And um, I started off as most other people would start off with a big literature review of like, what, you know, what's everything we know about this pond? And of course, going back to 1670, <laughs> um, it was quite a long list. And so there, there became, you know, this investigative 
level work that happened in conservation commission offices and in the state archives at UMass, um, anything related to Department of Transportation, highway bridges was relevant. Um, mass wildlife had of course been stocking fish in this in in Lake Warner since the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, there, there was really quite a lot of material there as well as, as, well as the, the special nature of the watershed um, that the lake sits at the very bottom of a, a 30 square mile watershed. So we've got Amherst and we've got Shutesbury and Leverett, mostly forested areas. Amherst, which is obviously the urbanized sort of influence, and then a tremendous amount of farmland um, down in the bottom on the Hadley Amherst line. Um, so for a person who's involved in watershed and wetlands, I mean, this is just a, the projects like this don't come along every once in a while. They, they drop in your lap and you're like, wow, okay. So I could really use everything that I ever learned to bring to this project. Um, and then it's a matter of how to figure out how to do it. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> We've, have, we've been involved in some various, you know, size projects. I was like, well, okay, well, we're going to have to take a really scientific approach to this. Um, and so we got some money from the CPA to assess the lake early on. Um, and we agreed with Kestrel that, okay, well, we had a few public meetings to decide whether we're going to keep the dam or not, because that was the question that was at first, you know, everybody wants to get rid of dams these days, but this dam cost more to get rid of than it did to save. And that was a big influence. And then also was the historical component of where we were. You know, this, um, this was the site of the first corn mill in Hadley. Um, this was always known as the center, as far as people, you know, that the lake preceded any development from the surrounding neighborhood in uh, Hadley. It, the, the lake preceded the incorporation of the four towns uh, in the upper watershed. So the pond has this extraordinary uh, piece of the landscape that really became of central importance, as well as the fact that Hadley had already repaired the dam at one point. You know, in 1947, the dam was only, um, or the lake was only 49 acres. And so when the dam needed repairing that time, they went around and took collections in the neighborhood and got a volunteer engineer to draw up the plans and they just went ahead and did it. And that was sort of how things were done in the, the 40s and the 50s. And, um, and the town was proud of that, you know, that they had that a, a sort of had as a really can do sort of attitude. Um, so then, you know, as I was going through the literature review, we go back all the way to 76, um, Again, coming out of UMass, phosphorus and sedimentation reactions. You know, the um, essentially Tanbrook was the sewage system for Amherst before um, treatment plants were developed. The treatment plant then was put right sort of at the base of Tanbrook when it was developed, but the discharge pipe direct, directly discharged back into the Mill River. So Wake Warner from the 30s up until the 70s, the Clean Water Act and the changes in Amherst's um, sewage treatment practice, and this was common across the country, you know, was direct discharge was, was, was eliminated essentially. But for 40 years, you know, they had periods of untreated or partially treated sewage being discharged into the Mill River, and this leads to high levels of phosphorus and nitrogen and other contaminants in the lake. So, this is basically the layout of, you know, 1988, the watershed management is looking at sort of what's going on in the pond. By 2001, we have a TMDL report, which finds out that Lake Warner has the highest predicted phosphorus load of any of the five lakes that they're looking at in the Connecticut River Valley area. So, you know, for 20 years now, we've known that phosphorus is a major problem in this lake. And um, they, it was a very nice report. And they listed a bunch of strategies for fixing these BMPs and, municipal um, best management practices and agricultural best management practices. And then of course, like most studies, that one went on the shelf and nobody was really left to coordinate how to figure all that out. You know, it, this, this has fallen on the backs of municipalities which are sort of understaffed and overburdened and um, strategic, man strategic watership management is not always taught in, to municipal um, managers. So a lot of exchange of information then goes on 
um, the, the E. coli bacteria level becomes an issue because of recreational waters. Um, Biodiversity did a nice study to look at mussels and used our, so we had a little bit of data from them. Um, but by you know 2010, I would say we we're all, our friends of Lake Warner is already starting to form knowing that something has to be done and maybe we're gonna have to be the ones to do it. So, you know, by the time we get to 2014 or 15, when we're ready to incorporate and essentially say we're able to take on the responsibility of dam ownership and how is all that gonna work, this is sort of where we're going. Um, so limnology, you know, is this beautiful study of flowing water and it crosses multiple different disciplines um, and it's got a long history as far as um, understanding aquatic sciences. And so I'm not gonna go too much into this. This is from another presentation, but um, you know, essentially we get to a point where we're looking at different levels of the lake what's going on in the upper levels, the middle levels, and the lower levels. The hypolimnion is where all that cool, dense water, and sometimes you get dissolved oxygen depletion. Um, transparency is used measuring a secchi disk. This has been you know, used since the late 1800s. Um, we looked at dissolved oxygen and temperature, which are main indicators of um, eutrophic water, bodies of water, but also developing a long-term um, basis for understanding how the uh, water body is reacting to both changes in flow and changes in you know trophic condition or development of aquatic plants and things like this but we can see in as early as 1980 you know that we're having dissolved oxygen problems in the in the lower levels of the lake so you've got transparency coming down to about six or six feet or so and then it drops off and so below that you can't have any photosynthesis and dissolved oxygen is cut down so these are these low these low levels of do um, so we began monitoring the lake um, on a bi-weekly basis sort of during the growing season and um, and looking again at phosphorus because phosphorus is the limiting uh, the limiting nutrient and as far as aquatic plants are concerned. So, you know, understanding where all these things are coming from and then doing something about them is quite something else. But, you know, this, this presentation was developed in 2015. So this is sort of where we were when we were beginning. Um, we understand that the, the urban environment and the natural interface that we're going to have problems and based on urbanization and increasing amounts of effluent that those problems are going to concentrate. We get to a point, you know, where your eutrophic levels are are set at a at a certain rate. And this again is sort of TM TMDL and EPA um, language that they produce every year, and we've been consistently above, you know, for eutrophic levels since I've been involved in this project, and they haven't really been going down in a very positive manner. Most recently, and when we have flooding events, of course, we have more discharge into the river, and the levels go higher. So this is some of the data from the original study in 2003. And we essentially tried to use these sites and then expanded from those sites based upon what we were finding by trying to bracket areas where we were finding high phosphorus, mostly focused on the tributaries. So the phosphorus cycle, this is the phosphorus cycle. And I love throwing these things up here because of course, you know, not everybody understands it and provides good source of discussion. Some phosphorus is pulled up into the plant matter, but most of it is lying in the sediments or being in some area of the litter fall or the decomposing plant mass. So you can understand that when you have aquatic plants growing in a system every time, every year, when all those plants grow and then die, they, they put it right back into the lake system. Um, so this phosphorus cycling and the sedimentary reactions, and this is all based on sort of the amount of iron or the amount of calcium and manganese that you have to offset or hold on to um, phosphorus that binds to phosphorus in the, in the sediments. Those releases are based on sort of your dissolved oxygen concentrations. If you have higher oxygen concentrations, then that exchange is gonna be less. If you have depressed oxygen concentrations, those reactions can be more and it can flocculate back into the system. So 
what happened was, is that people started to try to take notice about what, what are we gonna do? And so our watershed characterization was made, the TMDL was made, Every year the segment is, is analyzed by uh, DEP and then every five years they put out a, um, an assessment of a biological use um, summary. And you know, so we have these various levels of impairment and those are the areas where we concentrated on sort of what the focus of our, of our work is gonna be. Um, so we looked at tributaries, we then looked at um, different tributaries and the trends that were going on over the years. And like I said, this was sort of the beginning of where we, we were and now we have taken off. We now have 13 sites throughout the watershed, including the dam and the outflow. So we essentially have the entire thing monitored and we're doing it monthly now in association with UMass. Um, all the tributary sites, and I guess it's more than 13 since uh, Janice Weldon at UMass has several on Tanbrook. I think she has five sites on Tanbrook. So, so looking at the lake, and we do have the benefit of a lot of aerial photography and other types of um, GIS analysis. Mass Wild Mass GIS has been building these databases, so you have everything from subsurface lithology to soil types to vegetation types to land use to levels of urbanization. You have all these layers of information that you are going to use to try and figure out, well, what's going on in your watershed. One of the clearest ones is as we go through these by year, you know, is to start to see the buildup of aquatic plants and stuff in the rear part of the watershed. And by 1985, when we first started using uh, infrared radar. Let's see if I can enlarge this a bit. I don't know if that's better or not. Mm -hmm. we, started, we started using infrared radar. You can really start to see patches of, um, uh, of plant material picking up in the main body of water and sort of closing off the open water to the point where we get to 2001 and almost the entire surface of the lake is covered with, and it's mostly wolfia and lemna, but there's also definitely algae and, um, and other floating macrophytes in there, nymphia, nufar, the uh, water lily family being some of the most um, prevalent. In 2004, we did a plant bed map, um, and this again sort of, you know, gives you a baseline. So we went back and did this again in 2015 to look at changes, and you know, things are definitely getting more dense and floating aquatic material is taking over more of the lake. And this again is sort of indicative of high, high amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus um, coming in from the watershed as well as the sediments. So we, you know, we're, we focused on mapping essentially everything in the littoral zone. Um, we took 10 transects across the a lake and that was a good amount of information. I think it's going to be used later for sort of harvesting information or how to how to manage that a nuisance aquatic, aquatic plant growth. So in the early spring and fall, you know, it has water quality conditions in the mesotrophic range, you know, which right in, in the middle and it's the water is sometimes fairly clear and it's very pleasant. Um, some springs without enough rain, we get problematic algae blooms. Um, this was April in 2016. And then by July, you know, the entire lake surface is really covered. And so these are, you know, recreational hazards. They are, um, they're aesthetic hazards. And as we're going to hear more about, cyanobacteria loves to grow within all of these floating and decaying um, plant bodies. Uh, this was dissolved oxygen at the two meter lake. So again, when, when plant, when floating plants cover the entire surface, then we get depressed oxygen levels because there can't be light penetration and photosynthesis. So you get this traditional drop. Things are very high, if not even super saturated during June and July, and then a plummet in August and sometimes into September where things don't rebound until October. Um, this is made this year somewhat extraordinary because we didn't have a cyanobacteria advisory we didn't have really excessive um, floating plants or algae covering the lake surface during the entire year because we had four or five sort of bankful events. 
the, river, the lake got a tremendous flushing of uh, fresh water from the watershed. And it really loved that, even if everybody else did not. Um, we did some sediment testing, and this was pretty minimal, but what we're looking at is getting the rest of the lake tested for sediment and as well as the depth of sediment. So we can really get an idea of quantifying sort of how much material there is um, and looking for also nasty things that could be in there from runoff from development in the watershed. And so we found one alcohol of, um, of polychlorinated biphenyls, but it really was low um, and there wasn't anything to be concerned about. Heavy metals were found, found to be present, but in low quantities. Um, plant tissue samples taken were watershed was water chestnuts were clean enough to compost. Um, so a lot of work and coordination has been done with Stockbridge School of Agricultural Plant and Soil Lab and the Environmental Analysis Laboratory in UMass and having those resources close to us um, to provide high quality laboratory data really close to where our sites are is invaluable and they've been great cooperators. Um, <laughs> other issues that we look at are sort of how the river was treated as the development of the town um, came about. Um, the segment along Highway 116 has been entirely channelized mm -hmm. in the 1940s. Um, and so that caused, you know, the, the rerouting of that channel out of the old channel and allowing it to run through, you know, what essentially is a sandbox, more sandy deposits. Um, you know, along route, along route 116 sort of to the south um, has really diminished the habitat quality of that section of the river. And that's an area where I think we're looking at um, wanting to try and do some potential restoration. Um, the legacies of the water treatment plant, of course, the outfall now goes into the Connecticut River and avoids um, Lake Warner. Uh, but you also have to think about the amount of, of water that's being utilized by both the drinking water supply for Amherst and that all that flow that goes into the wastewater treatment plant is also now bypassing our watershed. So we've had less flushing that's been able to go on as well as probably increased um, irrigation pressure on flows into the Mill River and the lake. Ding, ding, ding. Is that it, time? Yeah, that's time. All right. Um, you're not reading your chat. I'm not, sorry. <laughs> All right, so I guess in closing, and, and there's so much more, and I guess you have to look on the website. You know, the, the history really tied this entire project together. I think that when you look back at the layers of information and, and the importance of an area, um, you know, in order to pull it all together, it's really taken an understanding of what's important to people and where you are in the place, as well as your assessment of, uh, of what's going on. So that's part of this discussion. That's why we did this. And um, the people that are involved are sort of integral to, to making this vision happen. And that's what this is about. So cheers and welcome. I take any questions. Since time is um, of an issue, perhaps we can ask people to send you chat questions. How do okay. you feel about that? Sure, that's fine. Oh, this is nice. Okay. All thanks. right. Okay. So thank you, Jason. And, uh, you know, it makes me feel like we need to have a bigger meeting for the town and have you do that presentation in, in uh, totality, but not today. Um, if you have questions for Jason, please send them through chat. <laughs>